Hello everyone, and welcome to What is the Difference Between Resident Evil the Novel and Resident Evil the Video Game? Here, on Crypt of the Unknown. Resident Evil. More specifically, the S.D. Perry novel that was based off the original PS1 video game. Let's start with the novel's prologue. The book, much like the video game, starts out with reporting these murders happening on the edge of the town, the town being Raccoon City. There are these outlandish reports that say that people have apparently been eaten, and people start to speculate if there's a cult, a cannibal cult, on the edge of town that is somehow coming into Raccoon City and eating people. Then there are also reports that it could be animals, as people believe there are a pack of wild hogs running loose in the Arklay Mountains next to Raccoon City. It is very unclear, and as people start to wonder, they want to take the law into their own hands and go out there and find whoever's doing it and kill them. And that's when the Mayor Harris shuts down the roads in the book. And soon after that, Chief Irons, the Chief of Police, says that the stars the Special Tactics and Rescue Service are going to be going into the Arclay Mountains and figuring out what's going on. The only differences here that I could discern were basically that the roads were shut down and it kind of elaborates more on things that in the opening cutscene into the game happen very quickly. And while the game starts off in July, the murders here have already gone on since the middle of May. And as the prologue closes, it ominously points out that the STARS team will be headed by Albert Wesker. And this is where we enter into Chapter 1. The story begins by exploring the background of Jill Valentine's character and how she's felt living in Raccoon City the past couple months. She's already considered leaving the STARS unit and ditching her job, not sure if working for law enforcement is right for her. A lot of these conflictions come from how her father, Dick Valentine, is a known cat burglar who taught her burglary skills as a child, including lockpicking. All the while she's contemplating this, Jill's running late for the mission briefing at Raccoon Police Department, focused on the incidents taking place within the town. The novel is quick to point out that Jill Valentine had made friends with two little girls in her neighborhood, Becky and Priscilla McGee, ages 9 and 7. This is why Jill decides to stay. Becky and Priscilla were the first victims of the recent string of vicious attacks, their bodies found around Victory Park, a location made up for the novel. It was there where Becky was laying, staring blankly at the sky, with her stomach eaten out of her torso. Priscilla's body was nearby, her frail limbs torn to shreds. They'd both died from the sheer trauma before bleeding out. Back at RPD HQ, Chris Redfield is talking to Forrest Spire who notes that Bravo Team has been given the go-ahead to take off to the Arclay Mountains to kick some cannibal ass. As Forrest leaves to take off with Bravo Team, Chris recalls his conversation with a character named Billy, a close friend working for Umbrella Pharmaceuticals. Billy begged Chris to meet him at Emmy's Diner a couple nights before, but he never showed. His absence makes Chris want to consider other possibilities rather than cannibals. Chris tries to shake off the tired feeling of unease as he enters the star's offices where Chief Irons is giving them orders. A couple things of note happen in the meeting. 1. Chris and Irons don't get along, and Chris feels like Irons has handled the whole operation terribly. 2. Barry makes a joke about whether or not Irons had taken a shit that day and if everyone should chip in to get him some laxatives for Christmas. 3. Barry claims that there are four plans inside the police office for the Spencer estate located in the forest nearby. Unfortunately, they can't seem to find them, almost as if they've disappeared. Joseph makes a joke about Barry either misplacing them or going senile. 4. Barry replies that he may be going senile, but he can still kick Joseph's ass. Joseph replies, yeah, would you remember it? 5. Altogether, the meeting and the banter just go to show how close-knit the Stars team is to each other. This chapter also establishes something that the video game doesn't outright do, and that's that the citizens of Raccoon City know about the mansion, remark on why it exists, and make the connection about how the murders have basically been occurring right around it. This leads to some of the inhabitants wanting to go and check it out. End of chapter 1 Chapters 2 and 3 basically play out together. Jill comes to the conclusion that it probably is animal attacks and that they're marking their territory. 
But before they can go on in their briefing, Bravo Team's helicopter has a malfunction and crash lands near Spencer Mansion. Investigation of some bizarre murders in the suburbs of Raccoon City. Nothing in our training could ever have prepared us for the nightmare that ensued. We never stood a chance. What's going on? Engine failure. Emergency landing. all over the radio. Wesker considers leaving Brad behind as he's too green in the field, but doesn't. He lets him fly the helicopter. And we get a little insight into Wesker's thoughts about the team and how he hates Chief Irons. None of this is specifically in the game, except for Bravo's helicopter crashing, and Alpha Team having to go out and save them. However, in Chapter 3, author S.D. Perry gives us a character that is not in the video game at all, a man named Trent, who hands Jill an M.O. disc with damning documents on it about important people or people she might know. Before she can look further into it, she takes bags of gear she'd been packing inside the RPD to the roof, and Alpha Team takes off to the Arclay Mountains to find and help Bravo Team. This is finally where the game meets the book. One more thing of note the book does is Jill tells Chris on their flight that they both have suspicions about what's going on and something seems fishy. But this leads right into Chapter 4. And Chapter 4 is basically the opening cutscene to the video game. And they play out just the same way. Alpha Team is flying around, flying around the forest zone situated in northwest Raccoon City, where we're searching for the helicopter of our compatriots, Bravo Team, who disappeared during the middle of our mission. It was Bravo Team's helicopter. Nobody was in it. But strangely, most of the equipment was still there. However, however we soon discovered why. Going forward, we will be explaining the book's path first, and then follow it with the video game's path. There will be slight variations and some corresponding character interactions. In the book, all four surviving members are alive and in the main hall of the mansion. In the game, it's only three members, depending on which character you chose to play as, Chris or Jill. Wow, what a mansion! Probably. No. 
instead of a gunshot being heard in the game. What is it? The book portrays the events with them hearing something moving. In the book, Chris heads towards the dining hall, and Jill, Barry, and Wesker remain in the main hall. Chris hears a noise from this hallway in the mansion he finds an ajar door. Upon entering it, the door behind him swings closed and is somehow locked, preventing Chris from getting back to the previous corridor where the tea room is located. After dispatching the first zombie, He tries the Keeper's bedroom, only to find that it is locked and emblazoned with a picture of a sword on it. He then heads to the northwest corridor and runs into another couple of zombies while hearing another behind him further down the hallway to the plant room. Having heard the shots, Jill and Barry head exactly to the door that Chris gets locked behind. Maybe it's Chris. Now Jill, can you go? I'm going with you. Chris is our old partner, you know. They unfortunately run into Kenneth Sullivan's half-eaten corpse and the zombie munching on it in the tea room. They dispatch it and take the ammunition off Kenneth's corpse. Barry makes an interesting remark in his personal thoughts. It smells like a slaughterhouse on a hot day. Somebody forgot to tell this guy that dead people don't walk around. All three doors in the corridor are locked, and no one understands why. They decide to report back to Wesker for a plan of attack. However, when they re-enter the main hall, Wesker is gone. Wesker! Help me look for him, Jill. And don't leave this hall for the time being. In the game when playing as Chris, he only starts with a knife, and Barry is missing from the team as they enter the mansion. When playing as Jill, Barry and Wesker are with her, and Chris is the one missing. The game wants you to find Kenneth's body first, and the introductory zombie with it to play out the iconic opening cinematic in the tea room. Jill's in-game scenario plays exactly the same as the book, excluding the Chris's blood scene, since Barry remains in the dining hall before you both return to find Wesker missing. Chris's path is slightly different, as he must come back to the main hall to find Jill and Wesker missing with Jill's Samurai Edge Beretta left on the floor. He still must go to the Northwest Corridor, but is via the second floor balcony in Yellow Hallway. End of Chapter 5 Chapter 6 just like in the game, Jill and Barry search the main hall. And also like the game, Barry gives Jill a lockpick. He sadly doesn't say she's the master of unlocking, though, in the book. We should start from the first floor, okay? And, Jill, here's a lockpick. It might be handy if you, the master of unlocking, take it with you. The book tries to make sense of why the horror cliché of splitting up would take place at this point, as Barry recommends that they do so. Apparently, the stars are trained to not partner up and are able to watch their own backs when in danger, which is kind of neat considering the odds of them surviving the night of the mansion would be very low. As Jill enters the small gallery, she decides to see what's on the MO disc thingy that Trent had given her. Again, anything to do with the character Trent is a book-only portion. What she finds out are names of scientists, most notably one named William Birkin, who she's not familiar with, and another one named Bill Robinson, Chris's friend who didn't show up at Emmy's diner. She also discovers that it has a map of the mansion and hints to the keys and crest she'll require to escape out the back exit. Pretty much all of this matches up with Jill would basically do when she finds the map in the vase here in this room anyway. It's interesting how S.D. Perry tied that in, but with her non-canon fictional character, Trent. Going back to Chris in the North Corridor, where we left him, Chris only has 15 rounds left and the book does make mention of his bowie knife. The first room to the left is locked here with an armor etching. Having killed the first zombie here, Chris heads down the hall to find two more. Much like in the game, zombies can sometimes get back up, if not properly disposed of. And the zombies here, at the end of the hall, do rise back to life. 
and Chris finds himself sprinting to the save room for safety. The zombie placement here in the book is exactly like the video game. But then the book cuts to Rebecca Chambers and how she ended up in the same room, the save room. Losing her gun during a dog attack and a sprint to the mansion, much like Alpha Team had to do. But the rest of the book plays out a lot like the cutscene in the game. Whoa! What is it? What? Oh! Oh no! Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> you must be from the Bravo team. Yes, I'm Rebecca. Rebecca Chambers. I'm a newcomer. I just joined the Stars Bravo team last month. Well, I'm really sorry. Are you all right? Yes. I'm Chris Redfield from the Alpha team. Are you the only person here from the Bravo team? Well, because the helicopter made a forced landing, I just ran into this house anyway, but I, uh... I see. There's nothing else you could have done anyway. It's good you're here. Yes, sir. But it's strange. I serviced the helicopter recently, but something went wrong with the engine. It was such a short flight. And then Chris tells her, hey, I'll be back. And that's the end of chapter six. Jill decides to unlock the dog hallway with her lockpick, which seems to already be coming in handy. One dog jumps through the window in the book, and not two like in the game. Up in the northeast corridor, Jill comes across another door, this one with an etching of a piece of armor on it. Behind the locked entranceway is the boiler room. Taking a second to recuperate, Jill feels enthused that she's escaped death thus far and makes a mental comment to bring her back to reality. Let's not have a party just yet, or has she forgotten that stars are being eaten in this hellhole? Jill takes a peek into the northeast corridor bathroom and nothing else, skipping the ceiling crushing and shotgun rooms in hopes of reaching the outside corridor where she thinks she'll find and secure an escape route. She follows a map in the device Trent gave her, and it's here that Jill finds another two zombies before finally reaching the outside path. A sense of accomplishment washes over her as she hopes they can hike a back road path down to the city's barriers. But she's stopped by the mansion's biggest enigma, the Crest Puzzle. The hint reads, when the sun sets in the west and the moon rises in the east, stars will begin to appear in the sky and wind will blow toward the ground. Then the gate of new life will open. Realizing she'd have to find all the pieces to this puzzle in the mansion, her hopes fizzle out and Jill languishes in the fact that the stars are trapped. Going back to Chris, before leaving the save room, Rebecca had given him one of the mansion keys. After finally killing the zombies in the northwest corridor with headshots, Chris makes his way back to the Keeper's room and reads the diary there.
This helps him understand more of what has transpired in this mansion incident. He now wonders if the virus is airborne, and if the STARS team are infected themselves. With this new information, he heads back to the save room to discuss it with Rebecca. In the game, it is possible for players to check the side room to the gallery and find ammunition under the desks in the L-shaped hallway. The boiler room is locked with the same keystone, and the small bathroom is able to be explored further than the book chooses to let on. Additionally, most players would choose to enter the shotgun room and not skip it, as it contains necessary items to survive the mansion. The zombie placement near the outside corridor is ideal for scaring players. Video game Jill doesn't have it as easy though as the actual back of the mansion has zombie dogs in it. For Chris, he'd finally be exploring the northwest corridor and plant hallway for the first time in the game. It's also not necessary to enter the keeper's room, as it contains scarce ammunition and a zombie closet scare that would waste ammo anyway. Chris would readily head to the piano room to push the game's narrative along. Chapter 8 We finally get to see what Wesker has been up to this whole time, and he's on the second floor of the main hall balcony, thinking about how many mistakes he's made thus far. He didn't expect Brad Vickers to leave them there like a coward and take off in the Star's helicopter. As his mission was to lead both Bravo and Alpha teams here to clean up the disastrous leak of the virus, he realizes he has to get to the labs underneath the mansion, but he doesn't have the crest to do so. The book is already hinting at the fact that Wesker is not who he claims to be, and is a secret agent within the stars. He recalls a telephone call he'd had with one of the few remaining scientists in the lab, who was suffering a mania from the virus, which is an apparent side effect, and how he was babbling about infected crows and giant spiders. He didn't want to encounter any of that, so he decides he doesn't have to find and unlock all the puzzles himself. He can use the stars team and quickly decides to blackmail Barry, as he's a family man that both Jill and Chris trust, implicitly. Obviously none of this happens in the video game, as you don't learn of Wesker's secrets till the very end, and it is neat that the book uncovers his motives. End of chapter 8. Moving right directly into chapter 9, we are starting with the book again as Jill checks the study on the first floor, but of course, it's locked. So she moves on to the crow room. While not figuring out the puzzle the first time, with a hint from Cradle to the Grave, she sets off the birds with an electric current going through their perch, and they attack. Coming back in after reminiscing about her time with her father teaching her about breaking and entering, Jill figures out what she needs to do to solve the puzzle. But before she can, we cut back to Chris and Rebecca, who have a conversation about virology and how it's possible infection overcomes a victim within less than 24 hours. After a brief recap on their thoughts, they both decide to head back towards the main hall. Then this is where the book diverts to Barry Burton and what he's been doing since he's left Jill's side and gave her the lockpick. He's in the basement kitchen, having broken down a door in the tea room's hallway after headshotting a zombie, and eventually Barry hears the elevator shaft nearby being used. And out steps Albert Wesker. Barry questions where he'd gone when him and Jill returned to the main hall. Wesker basically tells him that he had to go take a whiz. He then proceeds to explain to him how he has to destroy evidence in the underground facility and casually asks Barry to help him. Barry points his gun at Wesker, asking why he would do that and betray everything he stood for. Wesker replies that he has someone watching Barry's family very closely, and they will kill his wife and kid if Barry doesn't do as he asks. Letting go of his honor, Barry begrudgingly agrees to take a key from Wesker that can open most doors in the mansion, and Wesker tells him to do so and to help Jill and Chris whenever he can to expedite the process. And then Wesker leaves. In the game, the crow puzzle plays out the same exact way. Jill's walkthrough of events has stayed almost completely true so far, and it appears that S.D. Perry may have fashioned herself a fan of Jill's campaign more than Chris's, as most fans of the series tend to do so. It's an easier journey. As said in the previous chapter, Chris would normally head to the piano room, where then Rebecca would show up after 
and not the main hall like in the book. The scene with Barry does not take place in the game's story, but would vaguely be explained near the end in the lab. Bouncing back to Jill again, she's already solved the crow room puzzle and sets the first of four crests into its resting place. Using the Trent Mansion map, she finally decides to clear out the first floor and enters the shotgun room. After taking the firearm off its resting place, a loud mechanical motor whirs into action. She braces herself for a trap, only to find that nothing happens. She thinks nothing more of it until she finds herself locked into the ceiling room. She notices a steel lock in the slit of the door keeping her trapped. She tries to use precious shotgun ammunition to blow it off, but her efforts fail. She begins to panic. Outside, she hears Barry call her name and yells for him to blow the door open. Barry uses his python magnum to obliterate the lock and yanks Jill out into the hall. In the main hall, Chris and Rebecca hear the rumbling of the ceiling coming down from their location, but can't make out which direction it's coming from. Deciding to use the sword key, they get to the piano room, but on their way, they notice that some previously opened doors are now closed. Wondering who else is lurking around the mansion, Chris is plagued by suspicions once again. After realizing how secure the piano room is, Chris leaves Rebecca there and tells her to lock the door behind him. Rebecca finds the piano sheet music for Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata after shifting one of the shelves nearby. She sits down at the lavish musical instrument and begins to play. Her rationale is that the sound might draw any surviving Stars members to her location. As the wall next to her begins to move upward and startles her, she notices an emblem. Rebecca starts to put the pieces together that the emblem in the hidden room is just like the one in the dining hall. Perhaps there's a puzzle here that requires switching the emblems around. In the game, Jill's campaign is still exceptionally close to the book's scenario, but the writing brings us closer to Jill as a character as we learn more about how she's feeling and handling each situation as they unfold. Chris, however, is getting around the mansion in a similar route, but his character is trying to connect with surviving members more in the novelization. Rebecca wouldn't specifically follow you around, and she would have to play the piano to unlock the hidden room, but all this would be done by the player. The player would have to move the shelf and find the carefully hidden piano notes themselves. The player would also have to leave the piano room for a certain amount of time to let Rebecca practice playing the Moonlight Sonata. End of chapter 10.